NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents The Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hello, welcome to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm Jari Cook, I'm the Voyager Media Rep, and I'm gonna be your host and moderator for today's uh, discussion. Um, so we're here to celebrate the 35th anniversary of NASA's Voyager mission, and just so you know the exact dates, Voyager 2 launched on August 20th, 1977, and Voyager 1 launched on September 5th, 1977. Um, and just to give you some perspective on how long these workhorses have been going, here are some cultural landmarks from 1977, fresh from the internet today. Okay, <laughs> Jimmy Carter was inaugurated as president. The first Star Wars movies hit, movie hit the theaters. The first albums in a new genre known as punk rock were being released. Uh, the Bee Gees released the song, How Deep Is Your Love? And the first Apple II computers went on sale. And today's smallest iPod Nano, here's a fun fact for you, um, an eight gigabyte, eight gigabyte iPod Nano has about 100,000 times the memory of Voyager. So that'll put things in perspective a little bit. <laughs> but in that time, uh, Voyager 2 has traveled 15 billion kilometers or nine billion miles away from the sun. And Voyager 1 has traveled 18 billion kilometers or 11 billion miles away from the sun. So let's take a guided tour of the Voyager mission from some of the people who know it best. Um, we're going to have a two-part program for you guys this evening. First, we're going to have a talk by our Voyager project scientist, and then we're going to have a question and answer session with the team leads of the operating instruments on Voyager 1 and 2. So our first speaker is Ed Stone. Um, Ed Stone has the distinction of being the one and only project scientist for NASA's Voyager mission starting in 1972. <laughs> Ed has seen Voyager through the planetary encounters at Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and is now, like the rest of us, eagerly anticipating their passage into interstellar space. He has been part of the faculty at the California Institute of Technology since 1967 and was the director of JPL from 1991 to 2001. Ed was inspired to enter the fields of planetary science and space exploration by the launch of Sputnik in 1957. He continues to work on a variety of space projects, including serving as vice chair of the board of directors of the 30 meter telescope project, which is going to be building the most advanced and powerful optical telescope to date. So let's give a round of applause to Ed. Thank you. Thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be here. 35 years since launch. It's really wonderful and on the edge of our solar system. So I'm going to take you on an 11 billion mile journey over the next 30 minutes. So buckle your seatbelt. Here we go. <laughs> Well, this all, the journey got its start actually in 1965 when a graduate student from Caltech working up here during the summer discovered that there was a magic year, 1977, when you could launch a spacecraft and it could fly by the four giant outer planets. First Jupiter, then Saturn, Uranus, and finally Neptune. And to give you a sense of scale, the Earth is one astronomical unit from the Sun, 93 million miles. Jupiter is five. Saturn is 10, Uranus is 19, and Saturn is 30, uh, Neptune is 30 astronomical units. That was the journey the two Voyagers set out on with the hope of continuing on to interstellar space. Here's the spacecraft, and of course, we're in a room with a full-size model of Voyager with a main antenna, which always points at Earth, is 12 feet in diameter, and one of the tributes to the long, one of the reasons that's such a long life are these three radioisotope thermoelectric generators, the natural radioactive, active, radioactive decay of uh, plutonium-238 uh, generates heat, uh, which then thermocouples convert into electricity. A very simple, robust, long-lived power supply, 88-year radioactive half-life. So every 88 years, half as much power. So that's one thing which gave the spacecraft, the two spacecraft, their remarkably long lives. The first step in this journey uh, to the outer solar system was Jupiter at five astronomical units. Uh, 
and of course, we knew about the great red spot before launch. Uh, Voyager found that it was a huge hurricane-like storm system, uh, about two to three Earths across. Uh, but that was just the biggest. Every one of these white spots turns out to be a storm system. Even that smaller one is the size of the Earth. So you can see the atmosphere is riddled uh, with these storms. Uh, and then there were the moons, the satellites, which orbited uh, Jupiter. There's Io, which clearly has a very peculiar color, and Europa, twins in construct, but in fact quite different in evolution. When we first saw this moon, we had no idea what we were looking at. We had never seen anything like it before and have not seen anything like it since. Uh, and, and, and it was, took us uh, some time to realize the reason this moon looked so different was because it had eight active volcanoes. Before Voyager, the only known active volcanoes in the solar system were here on Earth. And here's a little moon with 10 times the volcanic activity of Earth. So suddenly our terracentric view of the universe had to expand enormously. Uh, and then there's the neighbor, uh, which is a similar sized moon, rocky moon, but covered with water ice, and in fact cracks in that water ice, suggesting that beneath it is a liquid water ocean, which the Galileo spacecraft really did show was the case, a place that's got to be very interesting in terms of the possibility of life, origin of life. On to Saturn, 10 astronomical units. Sunlight is 1% of what it is here at Earth. And this image, I like this image because Voyager 1 took it as it was leaving Saturn. It was the first time we had a spacecraft on that side of Saturn looking back, if you like, and able to see the shadow that Saturn casts on its own rings. Of course, the rings themselves turned out to be remarkably complex uh, objects with uh, wakes in the, in the rings from the moons that are orbiting like ships outside, they didn't even have to be in the rings to cause the rakes, wakes because of the gravitational effects. And Saturn had its interesting moons too. Two of them, here's one, which is Enceladus, again a small moon, icy moon. Indeed, it has an old part of the surface, which is heavily cratered, but it also has a much newer part of the surface, which has cracks and crevices as, because it had a geologic life. This is the brightest, whitest object in the solar system. Uh, it reflects almost all of the sunlight. And Cassini, which is now in orbit around Saturn, showed why. It found that from the south polar region there are some large fissures where, in fact, geysers are erupting, uh, fresh snow covering not only this planet, the, this moon itself, but also creating a ring, a very diffuse ring around Saturn. And then there's Titan, uh, as large as a planet Mercury, but you see you can't see the surface because unlike Mercury, there's a real atmosphere on Titan. 60% higher pressure than here on Earth, nitrogen-like here on Earth, but no oxygen. In fact, the trace uh, gas in uh, this atmosphere is natural gas, methane. And so the action of sunlight creates complex molecules, organic molecules, some of which polymerize and create an opaque haze that cannot, one cannot see through. But fortunately, Cassini, which is now in orbit, has a radar system which can look at the surface and indeed found that there are now there are lakes of liquid methane and other hydrocarbons on the, the surface of this world. And the chemistry that's occurring there today may closely resemble that which occurred early in Earth before life evolved and created the oxygen that we all breathe. So again, this has got to be a place that we're going to want to explore uh, in the future. On to Uranus, now 19 times as far. This was for the first extension of our mission. Originally, we considered mission success one of the two spacecraft flying by Saturn. Both did, and that allowed us to keep the second one in the plane of the planets headed on to Uranus. Arriving there in uh, 1986, the Uranus is tipped on its side. Its pole is actually right here. And one of the big surprises was the magnetic field. Again, before Voyager, the magnetic fields were like those of the Earth. That is, the pole of the magnetic field is very close to the rotation axis of the Earth. That's the reason a compass is useful. Uh, and that's because, in fact, the rotation of the interior generates the electrical current that creates the magnetic field. It was quite reasonable that it should somehow be aligned with the rotation. Big surprise at Uranus, the magnetic pole was closer to the equator than to the rotation axis. That was also true at Neptune. So again, our terracentric view had to be greatly expanded in terms of our understanding uh, of the origin generation of planetary magnetic fields. And there was another small moon, 
of, of, of Uranus called Miranda, which, although it's only 300 miles across, look at the complexity of its surface. There is indeed an older ancient surface, but these surfaces have been, these are all many earthquake faults, parallel faults, and uh, a large check on the check mark on the surface, very distinctive, and a cliff, which is miles high on this little tiny world that's only 300 miles across. So even a, tall, a tiny, cold, frozen world had at one time an active geologic life. Not now, but at one time. On to Neptune, 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth, one nine hundredth of the energy from the sun. And we expected, like Uranus, to have a very rather bland atmosphere because of no energy. It turns out not bland at all. There is a great dark spot, which has since disappeared, other spots, and the fastest winds in the solar system where there's the least energy to drive them. Another counterintuitive uh, discovery about winds on these giant planets. And Neptune also had a moon called Triton. Uh, this was the last object we visited in our journey. Uh, this was 1989. Uh, this is an even smaller moon uh, that, uh, is so, that's so cold. Uh, first of all, it's mainly water ice. So what you're seeing here is a water ice surface covered with, again, a very thin layer of hydrocarbons made in the atmosphere, a very thin atmosphere. And this polar cap is not water ice, it's nitrogen ice. It's so cold, it's 40 degrees above absolute zero. Even net nitrogen becomes an ice. And so this icy polar cap is nitrogen ice. But you notice these dark streaks. It turns out we found geysers erupting in that icy polar cap at 40 degrees above absolute zero. So time after time, what Voyager did was it, it really teach us that the solar system was much more diverse than we could have imagined just sitting here on Earth and under, trying to understand our own Earth. Uh, I could have gone on for the whole lecture just about the, the discoveries that Voyager provided in terms of our, uh, new, what I really say is a new view of the solar system. But there is a lot beyond the planets, actually, as it turns out. And, that, and that's now we're now on the interstellar mission. Once we finished with Neptune in 1989, we began what was then called the Voyager Interstellar Mission, a journey to interstellar space. That was 1990. And we are still on that journey. We are not there yet. Uh, but we're getting close, uh, as I will show you. This is the team uh, that's uh, uh, the Five of the, of the original 11 investigations are continue to operate uh, during this phase of the mission. And uh, the, the principal investigators, John Richardson of the plasma instrument, which measures the winds from the sun, and uh, the low energy charged particles. These are particles that move at percents of the speed of light. Uh, the cosmic ray subsystem, which measures uh, energetic particles with, uh, say, half the speed of light. The magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field of the planets and all the stuff that's between and what's beyond in interstellar space. And the plasma wave subsystem, which measures the radio waves uh, which are coming from, uh, from, the inter from interstellar space nearby. You'll hear, you'll have a chance to ask the PIs whatever questions you like, uh, and I will turn over all your questions to them to answer after my talk. Uh, here's the bubble the sun creates around itself. That's what's around all the planets. Uh, is this huge bubble. Yeah, there are the planetary orbits. Uh, here's Voyager 1 headed up out of the plane of the planets, and here's Voyager 2 swinging by Neptune and downward. So one's going north, one's going south. Uh, there is a wind from the sun blowing radially outward in all directions, supersonically, million miles per hour. It's the atmosphere of the sun uh, jetting away from the surface of the sun. Uh, and it, uh, as it moves out, it's getting thinner and thinner. And at some point, of course, it runs into interstellar space, the wind out here. And there's a boundary between the two winds. It's called the heliopause. So inside the heliopause, the wind is from the sun. Outside, the wind is from the explosion of supernovae 5, 10, and 15 million years ago, which created the wind which is outside. So it's a distinctly different part of the universe. And these two spacecraft will be the first to enter interstellar space. The, uh, to show you, the, here is the uh, source of this uh, heliosphere. It's the sun itself. This is a coronagraph uh, image of the sun taken by the Soho spacecraft, which is sitting out in front of the Earth, looking at the sun. The sun is the size of that circle. Uh, there's a disk in the camera to block the light from the sun so one can see the scattered sunlight 
from the wind, the electrons in the wind, which are streaming away. And indeed, you can see that there is a wind. You can just see the wind blowing, but how radial it is. And occasionally, you'll see these huge blast waves coming out from the sun. And you've probably heard about magnetic storms and aurora, which sometimes are observed far, far more, further south than normal. That's when one of these huge storms erupts from the sun and compresses the Earth's magnetic field. Those huge storms also propagate uh, deep out into, into the heliosphere and, and, in fact, gave us our first idea of how big it was. Uh, so these things really do exist. Uh, here is a Hubble image of the Orion Nebula. This is one of those helios astrospheres, of course. It's not a heliosphere. That's the sun. And out in front, you can see the bow shock because there's a wind from this direction being deflected around an invisible astrosphere. Uh, and there's even a small one up here. We're inside of such a place on our way out. Now, I can't show you a picture of uh, our heliosphere, but I can show you a picture of our kitchen sink. <laughs> And, you, and, and the, re, the point is that you see the heliosphere every time you look in a sink with the water running. All right, and that is, here's the water hitting the bottom of the sink. Notice the water is radially, flowing radially outward in all directions. Remind you of the picture of the solar corona? The water is moving not super, not, it's, you know, very fast, but it's faster than the waves on the surface of the water. So in that sense, it's supersonic. Uh, and so it just spreads out, not knowing what's outside, because it's traveling faster than any signal can get upstream. But it's getting thinner. At some point, it has to slow down. But you notice it doesn't slow down gradually. It abruptly slows down in a shock. And in the, in the case of the uh, solar wind, that's called the termination shock. It's the termination of the supersonic flow. Once the water slows down, then it can turn around and turn, flow down the drain. And that's exactly what goes on with the heliosphere except in three dimensions. And so here's the solar wind. Here's the termination shock where the wind abruptly slows down and start, begins to turn and flow down the tail of the heliosphere because the tail is the dr drain. All the wind from the sun, which can't run into the interstellar wind, has to turn and go down the long comet-like tail. So here's a mathematical model which captures all the things you see in your kitchen sink. Uh, inside here, uh, the colors have to do with temperature. Uh, inside, you'll see the radial flow, supersonic, one million or two million miles per hour, radially outward, until, boom, here's that shock. It suddenly slows down. The wind gets hotter when it, that happens, and you can see it starts turning. You can see every one of the flows starts turning, and all of them turn to flow down the tail. And the interstellar wind, the ionized part, is deflected around like this and flows around. Uh, this object, which is there in the solar, in the interstellar wind. Now, the first, uh, first, first estimate that Voyager could make of the size of this bubble, and nobody knew, and even today we don't know exactly how large it is because we haven't gotten outside yet, but we have a much better idea than when we were launched. We really didn't know how far it was from Earth out here to this boundary. But the first, so one of the things that was done by the plasma wave instrument that Don Gurnett uh, uh, runs is that there was a big blast wave from the sun. That blast wave traveled out through the shock, through this helio sheath where the wind is slow, into interstellar space and generated radio waves out here. So by measuring how long it took the blast wave to go from here to there and knowing how fast the blast wave was moving, it was possible to estimate how far it was. And that's exactly uh, what he did. So here is a soundtrack uh, which shows the wa radio waves. And if I can find the cursor, I will make this thing play. OK. These are the radio waves. That's when the first blast wave got to interstellar space. And we knew when it started the sun. And it was about 400 days it took to get out there. And that was 1982 when the sun was active. The next time the sun was active was 11 years later. And look what's coming. Another even bigger blast wave from the sun uh, was, uh, was, uh, started at the sun and again propagated out and finally reached interstellar space and
So using the timing from the sun to when the radio noise occurred and having an idea of how fast that blast wave was moving, uh, Don was able to estimate that it was between 117 astronomical units and 177, or some number like that. Uh, well, we're already past 117. We're now at 122, uh, but I hope it's not 177 before we get there. Uh, the uh, other, another key thing about what's happening when this wind abruptly slows down is the shock. Some of the uh, ions which flow like this slowly, some of them get trapped around the shock and bounce back and forth like a ping pong ball, gaining slowly but surely more and more speed until they have something like 1% the speed of light, which is a lot. Uh, and so those particles uh, are, are accelerated at the shock. The shock is a source then of these faster, they're called the low energy charged particles. And so as we were approaching the shock back in the early 2000s, uh, we were counting those particles, seeing how many of them there were. This is a logarithmic scale, so going from here to here is 10 times more particles. And you can see here is the shock. Suddenly, we saw the full intensity of these low energy ions moving roughly 1% the speed of light. And that was uh, at 94 astronomical units, 8.7 billion miles from the sun. That was December of 2004. And that was our first real met, uh, measure of how big this bubble was, is the location of this shock. And so in the sink, uh, basically, there was Voyager 1. Uh, and it, it, found the, uh, it found the shock at 94 astronomical units. It turns out that Voyager 2 was following along behind, uh, but it found the shock at 84 astronomical units, 10 AU closer to the sun, almost a billion miles closer to the sun than Voyager 1. And so I've, on the, uh, I've, what I've done here is draw on the, on the sink where you can see a circle, circle indicating that the, the shock was further from the source at Voyager 1 than at Voyager 2. Now that's true in the sink because there's a wall of the sink which keeps the, the pattern asymmetric. You might say, well, where's the wall in interstellar space? Well, that wall in interstellar space is a magnetic field, we believe, that the interstellar magnetic field is inclined in this way and pushes in on the southern, uh, uh, southern hemisphere of the heliosphere uh, more strongly than on the north, and the net result is to push the shock in roughly 10 astronomical units uh, closer uh, than in the north. Uh, so this, is, we had, this was one of our first indications of the, of the direction of the field, of its inclination, that it was inclined this way rather than that way, uh, and uh, uh, told us that it had to be strong enough so that it could at least press hard enough to give something like this much uh, distortion. Uh, north and south. So that's, that, that, that was a key part of this, uh, uh, of the journey. Now, the next step was, if, if you look at this, you'll see that the, uh, what we expected is once the wind crossed the shock, it would start turning. Be and so as we moved further away from the shock, the wind would turn because it had to turn to go down the tail. What we discovered instead, once again, Voyager surprised us, here is the speed of the wind just after we crossed the shock. Each year, we got further and further away from the shock. Here are the speeds. We were, remember the speed in the, before the shock was about a million miles per hour. After the shock, it was about 200,000 miles per hour. But it didn't actually just turn. It just slowed down and eventually ended up not moving outward at all, just sort of stagnant, uh, at least radially, uh, and in fact, uh, there's very little speed in any direction. We've been in this, in what I call a quasi-stagnation region, a transition region, where the wind is just sort of caught in a, in a, in a slow, uh, tur tur turbulent area. Uh, again, uh, we did not expect this, but it may well be a transient effect having to do with the 11-year solar cycle. Uh, the, in any case, what it means is that as Voyager 1 is leaving the heliosphere, here's the termination shock, Here's the heli sheath where the wind turns like this. There's this region out here uh, which, uh, where the inner edge was at 113 astronomical units. Remember the shock we crossed at 94. Uh, and it's a region where the wind is really not moving very much in any direction. Uh, and we've been in that region now uh, for over two years. Now, how do we know when we're leaving? Well, there are 
three different signatures of when we're in and when we're out. Inside, I showed you all of these particles that come from the shock, the ones that have 1% to 5% the speed of light. They fill this region, this heliosheath, but they're trying to leak out. They're all being carried out by the wind, which is moving out. And so we should see, once we cross, as we approach the heliopause, there should, we should see them starting to leak away. And once we get outside, they should really be gone. So one signature is that the low energy particles, the ones that come from the shock, we should see them decline and then boom, they should go away. That's one signature. Now there are lots of particles outside that can't get in. Those are the galactic cosmic rays accelerated by those new, uh, supernovae explosions I talked about. Now they're sitting out here, the fastest ones, those moving faster than half the speed of light, easily come in. They don't worry too much about this wind. But the ones that have only 10% the speed of light, Get, cannot really get very much inside this heliosphere. They're swept back out by the wind. And so what we expect as we move outward is those which are moving with 5 or 10 uh, uh, outward, give me this one, is those are which are moving inward from outside with, say, more than 40% the speed of light, we should start seeing them as we approach because they can get in a little ways. And the closer we get to the boundary, the more them we should see. So if we look at the particles coming from outside, as we move out, their intensity should grow, 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 and then finally, when we're outside, they should be at their maximum. So those are the two, two of the three signatures. So let's look at the data. This is the, these are the particles outside trying to get in. These are the high energy particles coming from the galaxy. Uh, and notice that this, this starts in 2009 through the beginning of 2012. And the rate was going up, as I said, because we were moving out at about 9% per year over the last three years. And then in May, that's what happened. Suddenly, in one week, they increased as much as, uh, in one month, they increased as much as they had in a year, uh, year by year before this. So obviously, something had changed. That was in May. Uh, if we look now at the ones inside trying to get out. So here's May. They didn't do much in May. These are the ones that are slow and uh, trying to get out. It's just intensity has been about this for seven years. Very steady, being carried from the shock. And there's June. Well, it's starting to decline a little bit. And here's July. Hmm, back up. Uh-oh. 50% down. First time we'd ever seen anything like this. Basically, in less than a day, suddenly half of the particles were gone. Whoops, they're all back. <laughs> So they were gone for five days, then they came back. Oh, there they go again, down and back. This time it was seven days down and back, and they went further down, as you can see. Uh, they didn't go to zero, but they're down now to one-third of what they had been. And all of this is on the web. You can all see this. And now, look at this. That's where we are today. Down to three out of 27. And, and we have a little more data that just came in today, which is basically at the same low level. So the ones inside obviously are beginning to leak out. Now let's look at the ones outside. Here's those particles from the outside, which had this increase in May. Look at this one. It's exactly the time when these leaked out, these were coming in. When these leaked out, these were coming. So the, and look, this is the highest cosmic ray rate we have ever had, and that it is coming in at the very time when the ones in outside have leaked out. So there is some kind of connection between where Voyager is and the outside, which lets the particles that are inside out and lets the particles outside in. Question is, how much further is it to the heliopause, right? Uh, we don't know whether this, these are special filaments connecting to the outside or whether we're dancing along the edge of a new region which is connected to the outside. This is all exploration because there is no model that has predicted uh, this kind of detailed uh, variation as we approach the heliosphere. And here's the website, by the way. Both of these plots are updated every day at this website. So if you want to be an explorer, just check it out. That's where I look every morning when I get up. And you can see it changes every day, so you have to look every day. So the other third signature is the magnetic field that's carried out by the sun. 
the, the solar wind. The solar wind blows radially outward from the sun and carries with it the magnetic field. And if the sun weren't rotating, the magnetic field would be carried out straight, just like the wind is blowing. Well, the sun is rotating with a 27-day period as observed from the Earth, and that rotation means the field is wrapped into a huge spiral. And that's what I've tried to indicate here. This huge spiral is a magnetic field which starts at the sun, is wrapped around, 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 and keeps getting wrapped further and further out as the wind carries the magnetic field out. So inside the heliosphere, the field is east-west because that's the spiral. That's what it's been ever since Voyager was launched. That's what it's been ever since there's been a spacecraft in space, is east-west uh, when you're down at low latitudes. Well, what's outside? Well, I've just told you the magnetic field outside, we believe, has to be inclined and has to be other than like this. It has to be so it pushes in on the south. So a, a third signature will be the direction of the magnetic field. And that's the hardest signature to get because the field is exceedingly weak. But that's the one which uh, typically will take us uh, weeks, if not a month, beyond when uh, the real-time data that we have that comes from the particle experiments. So that will be uh, a very important feature as well. But if there's one thing we've learned from Voyager, no matter how clever we think we are about the signatures, is almost surely to be something that we haven't figured out when we get there. And that's going to be the most interesting thing of all. So, where are we? Voyager 2 is 9.3 billion miles from Earth, about 100 AU. Voyager 1 is 11.3 billion miles, and that's 122 AU. It's in this quasi-stagnation region. Uh, Voyager 1 moves a billion miles every three years. So it's hard to imagine it's going to be too much longer, but I can't tell you whether it's days, months, or years. I really can't tell you. Uh, we have no models which tell us exactly how much. That's the, that's the nice thing. From a science point of view, there is so much that we're learning that uh, we had no way of really understanding before Voyager. So happy birthday, Voyager. The journey continues. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Ed, and um, we have a very distinguished panel for your question and answer session. Um, all of these guys have won multiple, multiple awards, so I'll say that in advance. Um, the first person we're going to introduce is Don Garnett. Uh, he's going to come up to the stage here. He's the principal investigator of the radio and plasma wave science instrument on Voyager. This instrument is essentially a radio receiver that helps scientists understand radio emissions and waves that move through charged particles and hot ionized gases. His group designed and built the instrument, and he has led the team since 1986. A key finding from the instrument was the first detection of radio emissions generated at the heliopause by the interaction with an interplanetary shock moving outward from the sun. Don is also a professor of physics at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, a principal investigator on NASA's Cassini mission to Saturn, and a co-investigator on ESA's Mars Express orbiter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Our next panelist is Tom Kermegis. He's the principal investigator of the Low Energy Charge Particle Instrument on Voyager. He designed and helped build the instrument and has led the team since 1971. The Low Energy Charge Particle Instrument measures and maps the charged particles streaming off of our sun, which originate from inside our solar system, as well as those inside the magnetic bubbles around the giant planets. A key finding from this instrument is the discovery of multi-hundred million degree plasmas in these magnetospheres and the recent finding that the solar wind at Voyager 1 uh, has a zero uh, velocity coming radially off the sun. Tom is emeritus head of the space department at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, and he has also designed and built instruments that have flown to all eight planets. He also has something going to Pluto, but it's not a planet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Norman Ness is a principal investigator on the magnetometer instruments on Voyager 1 and 2, which measure both very weak and very strong magnetic fields. He's been the principal investigator since 1970. 
A key finding made by the magnetometers was the discovery and mathematical description of the strong and oddly configured intrinsic magnetic fields of the giant planets Uranus and Neptune, visited by Voyager 2. Uh, Norman has been studying magnetic fields throughout the solar system, stretching back to the Explorer, Pioneer, and Mariner missions. He's also a professor emeritus at the University of Delaware in Newark. And our final panelist is John Richardson. He's the principal investigator of the plasma science instrument, which measures the low energy charged particles in the solar wind. He has led this team since 1997. The plasma science instrument was part of the groundbreaking science at Jupiter's moon Io, uh, where Voyager discovered active volcanoes, and the plasma science instrument discovered a donut-shaped cloud of ions and electrons surrounding Io, composed mainly of sulfur and oxygen. Uh, the Voyager 1 plasma instrument is no longer operational, but Voyager 2's plasma instrument has been watching the changes of the solar wind in the southern part of the heliosphere. John is a principal research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge. All right, so we have a microphone set up for you guys in the middle aisle, so if you'd like to ask a question, you can come right up to the microphone. Hello, my name is uh, Steve Guerin. I was just uh, curious. I, I know that the last time this configuration of planets existed was around the time of Thomas Jefferson as far as the, uh, that configuration. So um, obviously you launched in 77. What about the fact that you happened to go in direction of the bow shock? Was that also just a coincidence as well? That was uh, Obviously we went the direction the planets were. Fortunately, that was the direction of the nose of the, sp of the heliosphere. Otherwise, we'd be still going down the tail. So that was a complete oh. just luck. Luck. Lots, there's lots of luck in this business. Lots of luck. Thank you very much. Well, we've had uh, Ulysses flying around the same time and making its discoveries about the fast and slow uh, solar wind. And just wondering, in addition to what you're finding right around the termination shock, um, what have you been surprised by about the speed of the solar wind and, or the orientation of it uh, in the outer planet regions just along the way? Well, the surprising thing has actually been at Voyager 2, the speeds are very different in the helio sheath than, than at Voyager 1. At Voyager 1, Ed just showed you that the solar wind has essentially stopped, whereas at Voyager 2, it hasn't slowed down at all. It's in a hurry to get down the helio tail and go down the drain. And it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's been staying at the same speed, but it's turned about 55 degrees from the radial. What influenced your decisions to send the spacecraft out of the plane of the planets after their final encounter? Uh, again, the planets did that. When we flew by Saturn, Saturn was inclined in the sky like this. We wanted to fly behind the rings in order to probe the rings by sending radio waves to Earth. That meant Voyager 1 had to go like this and up out of the plane of the, of the planets. Because Voyager 1 succeeded, we could leave Voyager 2 in the plane of the planets uh, and having already done the Saturn science onto Uranus. If, if Voyager 1 had not completed the Saturn science, Voyager 2 would have gone exactly the same trajectory and would have had, would have had no more planets to, uh, to explore. In case of Voyager 2, we flew over the north pole of Neptune because the moon Triton I talked about is an inclined orbit that was down behind Neptune, so we had to fly over its top to get down to it, and that sent Voyager 2 south. Thank you. And, and what is causing the, the difference in the distance traveled between the two craft? Uh, are, is Voyager 2 going slower than one? Yes. Voyager 2 was launched on a slower trajectory, did not fly as close to Jupiter. It was safer. Uh, and uh, so that was one of our safety features was if Voyager 1 had a problem with Jupiter, Voyager 2 was further away. But that meant it didn't get as large a boost from Jupiter uh, flyby. And so it's on a slower trajectory. Right. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I have some questions up here. Um, one of them that I think would be uh, really great for Tom to answer. Oh, oh well, we'll take a question from her just in a minute. Uh, but uh, one of the questions is, I guess, about the longevity of Voyager uh, 1 and 2. Um, tell us a little bit, I guess, about the unexpected longevity of your instrument, the low energy charge particle instrument. Um, I heard it was, uh, there's a stepper motor that's a rotating device, and I think you had mentioned earlier today that it was rated for 500,000 steps. Where are we at today? 
Well, uh, we're at uh, six million and going strong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, as, uh, as Ari mentioned, uh, uh, and as Ed pointed out, the antenna is always pointing at the sun. So if you want to look around at 360 degrees, you've got to do it yourself in your own instrument. So we built a stepper motor that goes click, click, click every 192 seconds. And then it stops and then turns back and goes the other way. Otherwise, we would wind <laughs> ourselves into a problem. So uh, most of our engineers thought that uh, you shouldn't do any such thing on a spacecraft. Uh, it will grind to a dead halt in a few months. And uh, so we tested one for 500,000 steps, which would be enough to get us to Saturn, which was the original mission for Voyagers 1 and 2. And uh, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say? Great. Well, we'll take another question here. I was wondering if you might explain the code, how you would interpret the code on the instructions if somebody found the disk. Well, it turns out uh, the the, uh, the main uh, the main thing is that there are, uh, there is a star shaped symbol on there, which you may notice. Uh, that is the direction to a, a series of pulsars, which are unique rotating stars, and uh, so presumably an intelligent being uh, would be able to recognize which stars those were because of a very characteristic spin rate, and then localize where the Earth is, where the spacecraft came from. So that's in simple terms what that Black is all about. How about the other parts of it? Because that well, the other part, the other part has to do with the fact what's behind that cover is a old-fashioned phonograph record with grooves, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a little uh, thing to uh, sort of explain to uh, an intelligent being how, what to do with this grooved record. And there's <laughs> even a phono cartridge on the spacecraft uh, that can be used to play the record. And it, uh, the record has sounds of Earth. Lang greetings from different languages of Earth, music from different cultures of Earth, and uh, roughly over 100 images of Earth. Uh, so it tries to capture a picture of the place which sent uh, this message deep into space. And then finally, there's a little symbol on the um, bottom to the right, a couple of circles. With the oh, I think that's probably the hydrogen molecule because that's a characteristic molecule with a characteristic frequency. And so again, any, it'll be the same anywhere uh, in the universe. Thank you. Great. Well, I think that means that uh, the message they should get is that Voyager is groovy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, we have another question uh, from Ustream because we're also streaming this live on the web. Um, one question is about how we define the size of the solar system. So um, the Oort cloud, if it exists, is sometimes described as the edge of the solar system, and Voyager is trying to get outside the solar system. So how do we define how big the solar system is? <laughs> well, I, it's the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've stumped Ed Stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, uh, it's clear the Oort cloud, which is a cloud of comets uh, around the Earth, uh, is uh, the outermost remote parts of the solar system. But those, that cloud is in interstellar space. It's, it's outside the bubble around the sun. So we think of the bubble around the sun as the sun's domain. But of course, the sun's gravity extends well deep into space, and until you get closer to another star than the sun, the sun's gravity is still in control. So in that sense, there is no clear edge to the field of the gravity of the sun, but there's a very clear edge to the solar atmosphere. That's the heliopause. Inside, you're in the sun's atmosphere. Outside, you're in the wind from other stars. That's a very clear boundary, but it's really not the edge of the solar influence from a gravitational point of view. Great. We'll take another question from the Is audience. Is JPL planning the next uh, mission for deep space? How long will it take? Uh, are you going to use gravity assist to reach twice the speed, ten times the speed, so that uh, we don't have to wait 35 years yeah. for the next vision? <laughs> and I have a suggestion. Instead of uh, whatever kilobytes there, put an iPhone in there. <laughs> Tommy, you want to talk about the, uh, a, a deep space probe? Have you been on, I guess you've been on yeah. some of those studies. Well, uh, 
it turns out that it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> um, and uh, if, uh, if you use the, the biggest rocket that is currently in existence, it will not catch up with Voyager for at least 15 years. Uh, if you had a, a rocket that is a little more capable than the Saturn V, then you would get to about 200 astronomical units in 25 years. So we can do better than uh, what Voyager is doing, but it's going to be a long time before any interstellar probe catches up with Voyager, even if there was one. There are no plans to have one, as far as I know. OK, we'll, we'll take the next question. Yes, I wondered if you could just speak to the theoretical limit of the mission. I know, obviously, the, in, uh, the hardware has uh, achieved uh, amazing longevity. But at what point will you start to lose the signal from the spacecraft, or will there be some other factor that means that it will literally just disappear off the radar? If nothing breaks, the uh, first thing that will happen is we will run out of power. This radioisotope power supply, it's radioactive decays, 88-year half-life, so every 88 years we have half as much power. So we can predict fairly accurately, and we're turning systems off one by one as the power decays. We'll have to start turning off our instruments, our scientific instruments, the first one in 2020, and by 2025 we'll have to turn off the last one. Uh, and that's just power. So if nothing breaks, uh, we can keep returning scientific data until about 2025. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll take the next question, too. What is the, uh, the transmission latency between, from the two craft back to Earth? And has there ever been a need to do a transmission between both of the craft themselves? Oh. <laughs> uh, the, it's about uh, 17 hours one way now for Voyager 1. And there is really no way to communicate. These two spacecraft are over 100 astronomical units apart. And you know, at 100 AU, you can barely communicate from the spacecraft back to Earth, which has 70 meter antennas receiving the signal. It's not possible. OK, thank you. We'll take another question. Yeah. Ed, what, what are your personal recollections of Voyager's uh, pale blue dot photo? I'm sorry, Ms. what? The pale blue dot photo oh. that Voyager took. Well, I th I th we, uh, we took uh, well, the last image taken by Voyager 1, or by either Voyager, was taken by Voyager 1 uh, in February of uh, 1990. Uh, that was the last image before we turned the cameras off and unloaded this software on the spacecraft. Uh, and it was a family portrait where we managed with a series of mosaics linked together to take the first image. And really, it was a, this is the first time we had a spacecraft with imaging outside beyond all the planets. It was a, it's a historic milestone. And I think it's the kind of thing that really is part of establishing uh, what Voyager's done. It, you know, just like crossing an interstellar space, that'll be a historic moment when the first object launched from Earth finally leaves the bubble. Okay, great. Well, I have a, another Ustream question, and this one I think maybe Norm could take. What is responsible for the interstellar magnetic field? What do we know about it? Uh, the interstellar field is estimated by astronomers, astrophysicists, by observing other sources, as Ed has mentioned, not only of particles, but of emissions in various frequency wavelengths and by the, looking at the polarization of some of these emissions and the pattern, they've tried to deduce what the interstellar magnetic field should be between us and them. But that means you, they're integrating over a huge region of space. And they have to assume, put in simple assumptions about what the structure of the magnetic field would be and all of that. Uh, we're measuring uh, a magnetic field that's uh, pretty small. Let me compare it to the interplanetary magnetic field, which is just here at one astronomical unit, which is on the order of a six nanotesla. That's actually quite small by comparison with the Earth's magnetic field at the surface, which is on the order of 30,000 nanotesla, 50,000. We're talking about interplanetary magnetic fields that have gone through the termination shock and are now measuring about 0.4 nanotesla. 
The estimates by the people studying the interstellar magnetic field talk about four to six uh, nanotesla, possibly, or one-tenth of that. There are ranges, of course, for this, and there are change, differences in the orientation, although many of the models uh, are, shall we say, somewhat speculative. Uh, the orientation in some of the models that are used today in studying the Voyager data take into account the difference in the distance to the termination shock and the oblateness, the non-spherical symmetry of the uh, termination shock, apparently, with only two-point measurements. We have a sparsity of data. We're very thankful we have those two, I must tell you. Uh, uh, just a quirk of life. We didn't really measure the termination shock itself on Voyager 1. It was one of the few days that the deep space network was not properly recording data from Voyager 1. We deduced by the physical measurements we made the previous day and the following day that there had to have been a physical shock in plasma physics, which is well defined by changes in the properties of the plasma speed, the magnetic field, etc. In the case of Voyager 2, we measured the termination shock on one day, but actually we measured it four times because the termination shock is in motion. In fact, many of these boundaries have intrinsic motion as they, in a sense, behave. They're mentioning the heliospheric current sheet, which separates the polar magnetic field of the sun. Uh, it's a very complex and challenging interpretation for us, I should say, rather boldly to go forward, not only to make the measurements, but then to interpret them in the full three-dimensional space that we have to uh, picture, which will explain not only what we measure, but what other spacecraft measure. There are other spacecraft that are making measurements, like IBEX, which is a spacecraft of NASA, that's looking at sort of a boundary that's related, we think, to the uh, heliosphere. We, uh, we are learning a great deal. One point I wanted to add, I didn't hear you mention gravity assist. Mm. Voyager used gravity assist to get out to Neptune much faster than it could have with the launch vehicle propulsion system that was employed. In fact, they cut it down from about 30 years to, what was it? 12 years. 12 years, 77 to 89. Uh, Voyager was the second JPL spacecraft that used gravity assist. Uh, Mariner Venus Mercury, launched in 73, used the gravity assist at Venus to get into an opportunity to encounter Mercury, which it actually encountered three times because of, in this case, the circumstances and luck as it goes along. The gravity assist that Venus gave to, Merc to uh, Mariner 10 put it on an orbit that had the same orbital period, not the same um, place in space, so as it went by Mercury three times successively, Mar Mariner 10 was another great JPL spacecraft uh, with which I was involved. And I must say, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate all the JPL engineers and technicians and the tender loving care <laughs> which they took in the spacecraft with which I've been involved and we've all been involved here. And NASA is duly proud of this facility. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll take a question from Trina. So the spacecraft was basically instrumented to explore the giant planets, and now you're in a very different uh, part of the solar system. If you could add one instrument to the spacecraft, <laughs> 
Well, what would you add and why? Don, what would you add? Well, let's see, I'd, I'd like to have plasma measurements <laughs> <laughs> on Voyager 1 in particular. It's just too bad the plasma instrument uh, failed or had a problem very early in the flight. Uh, well, I suppose in my own field, the radio thing, I wish we had radio direction finding. We just have two dipole antennas and we hear these radio emissions, but we can't exactly tell where they're coming from. On Cassini, we have three antennas. And with three perpendicular antennas, you can do radio direction finding. I, I would have dearly loved that because these radio bursts we get from the heliopause, it would be just great to be able to tell just where they co come from. I'm sure other people would have different answers for this question. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll take another question from here. So if a person is ever uh, out at this distance, is there any... Is there safety provided by the sun and the solar wind? Does the radiation get worse for a person once they're in interstellar space, or is there not so much difference uh, once you've gotten that distance? Well, we don't know what's in the interstellar space at low energies because it can't get in. So uh, it can't be any, uh, at, at least the cosmic rays have to be higher than they are uh, here. Uh, we already know they're quite a bit higher just where Voyager is today, much higher than they are at 1AU, because this, the, the, at one astronomical, because the heliosphere provides a sort of shield. And at the lowest energies, it's a very good shield. They just don't get in at all. And so one of the key objectives, once we cross into interstellar space, is what is the intensity of these cosmic rays that are, have too slow a speed to get in? Right. Well, I remember, Ed, one thing that you had told me before that I thought was really interesting in trying to help you picture what it's like out there is that it, it, tell us a little bit more about what it's like for Voyager 1. It, it's very cold, right? How cold is it out there? Uh, hmm. How hot is it? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the point is it's, it's deep space, so uh, we're very far from the sun. We're, you know, so the amount of sunlight now is one ten thousandth of what it is here, so the temperature is correspondingly very cold. Uh, I mean, tr Triton was at 30 astronomical units. It was 40 Kelvin. So uh, we're now three times further away than that. It's going to be another, it's, it's 10, I don't know, it's 10 Kelvin, some number. I don't know the exact numbers. It's very, very cold. Someday, three degrees Kelvin. So, yeah, once right. you get far enough away, it'll be three degrees Kelvin, which is the black, uh, cosmic background radiation. Great. Okay, we'll take another question from here. Um, listening to the discussion, it sounds like you expected that we're going out through the bow, not out the tail. How was that known? Oh. It, it sounds like you were, you know, this is something that you knew before you yes. went out and said, oh, here we are. Very good question. Uh, it turns out that the interstellar wind I've been talking about is the ionized part of the wind. It's the part that can't flow in. It has to flow around. But there's also a neutral, there are lots of neutral atoms out there of particular kinds. Uh, hydrogen in particular, it's hard to ionize, so there's, uh, there is neutral hydrogen. And the neutral ion atoms can sort of flow right in. And uh, the helium actually gets clear into Earth. We actually can detect it at Earth. So back in 1960s, the first experiment was done, which looked at the scattered sunlight scattered off the hydrogen coming in. And since there was more scattered light coming from this direction than from that one, that's where the wind was coming from. So we already knew even before Voyager was launched that that was the direction the wind was coming from. And that's the nose of the heliosphere. Great. Thank you. We'll take another question. Uh, it was mentioned that the uh, interstellar uh, space is uh, full of uh, particles from uh, exploded supernovae. Are there other theories or uh, projections as to what is comprised of interstellar space? Well, interstellar space has this wind from the explosions. Mm -hmm. It has the energetic cosmic rays from the explosions. Uh, it has a magnetic field that's generated in the galaxy, which is trapped and carried by these exploding clouds. Uh, those are the main features. Uh, and, and there are radio emissions now. We know that there are very low frequency, two kilohertz radio emissions, which Don's instrument detected first time back in the early 90s. Uh, so there, and undoubtedly, there are things out there that we really just don't know are there. You'll find out soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll take your question. I just have a question about you know, how technology has developed. I mean, you're receiving signals from Voyager, uh, you know, you've been receiving them since the 70s all the way till today. Now you're, in the 70s you were, you were receiving them with 70s technology, and then that's advanced. Uh, I mean, if you had 70s technology today, you probably wouldn't be able to 
get all the readings that you're getting. But you know, you didn't know what the technology was going to be now. So I just, how does that develop, or how does that happen? Well, no, that, that certainly there's been an evolution on the ground. I mean, the one thing we did between uh, uh, Saturn and Uranus was. Uh, to expand the antennas, which used to, 70 meter antennas used to be 64 meters. The 34 meter antennas used to be 26 meters. Better receivers, lower temperature receivers were added. Uh, we added, a, we had on board a special coding system, which had never been used on the spacecraft before, which is now in your CD players, but it was on the Voyager spacecraft back in the 1970s. We turned that on after Saturn uh, so we could do a better coding job, better, more efficient coding job. So we even managed to do a few things on the spacecraft to improve uh, software-wise, but the main improvement has been on the ground. But without those improvements, would you have been able to make uh, the way, when, One thing that's interesting, that when we launched, if we had done nothing to the spacecraft and nothing on the ground, we could not have returned a single image from Neptune. Well, one, one big difference now is they can array the antennas at the Deep Space Network, combining the big 70-meter antenna with a 34. In fact, we have to do that to get at least yeah. our signal back, yeah. these uh, radio wave sounds that, that uh, Ed played for you. Yeah, for Neptune, we arrayed the 27 antennas of the VLA in New Mexico, along with our 70-meter antenna out of Goldstone to get the signal back from Neptune already. I think that was first done yeah. right at Neptune. Yeah. Never before arrayed them yeah. like that. Great, thank you. And I'll, we'll take a question from the guy who looks like he's wearing a vintage Voyager yeah, t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Neptune encounter. Ah, nice. <laughs> uh, this question is for Don Gurnett. Uh, since you made your prediction, uh, looks like a really good prediction of where we would encounter the, uh, the heliopause. Have you learned anything that would make you decrease the error bars on that? Now, of course, we're at 122 now and haven't uh, gotten it, so the 117 will increase. But have you found out anything that would make you decrease the 177? Well, let me, let me just comment on your comment. You said it was a very good prediction. I agree with you. <laughs> uh, I'll just give you a little bit of history on that. You know. As Ed explained, uh, in uh, 1983 first and then later in 92, we detected these very intense radio emissions at 2 to 3 kilohertz. And at first we didn't know uh, where they were coming from. We considered uh, other stellar objects as producing this. We thought it might be coming from maybe Jupiter and we just didn't, you know, we didn't have any directional capability. And then in looking at the data, I realized that there was this tremendous series of solar flares and coronal uh, mass ejections 400 days earlier in both cases. Now here was my first reaction. We knew the shock, the, these coronal mass ejections produced a huge shock wave that was, you call it a blast wave moving out in the solar, through the solar system. And it was moving at uh, six to 800 kilometers per second, and I just put that number in my hand calculator. I knew the speed, 400 days, and I got 166 AU. And uh, that was when we were at maybe 45 AU yeah. or something like that. And I don't remember, it was around that era they were considering turning Voyager off. And there had been various predictions about the distance of the heliopause in fact, the very earliest one, I think, was actually 5 AU, just right. a little beyond uh, around Jupiter. <laughs> and there were other ones, 10 AU. I, I've got a whole list of them. I could, if I had my computer here, I could show you. And uh, I sat back and dare, I told myself, do I dare talk to anybody about this? <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think anybody wanted to wait 19 years until we might get to the heliopause. So I sat on this for a bit and, uh, uh, and had, I had to refine the number a little bit because I knew the shock would probably slow down as it, once it got beyond the termination shock. You know, it, it, I had to extrapolate the shock speed out there. So anyway, we published this in 1993 and uh, the two speeds, uh, shock propagation speed, six or 800, we, at that time I didn't know which was the best. I mean, it's not that easy to get these shock propagation speeds. You get different numbers from different spacecraft. And like all of physics, you don't get a perfect answer. 
And I came up with a limit of 116 to 177 AU, and we're past 116 now. And, and we now think, and I've published a couple more papers, that we sort of refined the shock propagation speed this, from this big blast wave. And uh, probably the 600 kilometer number is better. And I think if you use that number, along with some simulations, uh, you get a, a distance to the heliopause of 126, plus or minus a little bit. So I have refined that. I can show you the papers. But you know, I t used to tell myself, Every year that goes by that we don't detect a termination shock, Don Gurnett's model is just that much more likely to be correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I now pre feel pretty good about that, frankly. <laughs> Thank you. Can't lose now. Great. OK, well, we'll take another question here. So this uh, kind of struck my fancy. You said you were going to turn the instruments off one by one from 2020 to 2025. Who goes off first? And how do you make that decision? We'll flip. <laughs> Arm wrestle? We haven't really tried to deal with that because it's, a, you know, it's eight years off and things could change on the spacecraft. Uh, so uh, uh, I, th I think that's a, something to be dealt with when it's closer to the maybe a few years out from when it's going to happen. I have the lowest power, by the way. Yeah, see, that's, <laughs> that's a big advantage, right? Two watts. Two watts. It's only two watts, so that's going to be the last one we turn off. Of course, well, some of us could die in the meantime. No, that would make no, it easy. No, 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 no. Well, that segues into a question that we often get asked, which is about um, turning instruments off, especially the camera. So why was it that that solar system family portrait was the last picture? The computers on the spacecraft are very limited. The memories on them are 8,000 words. <laughs> a word is about one and a half bytes, so that's 12,000 bytes. Think of your cell phone, gigabytes. So we wanted to make room in the computer to do the best possible job for the interstellar mission, and we unloaded all the software which was there to run that whole set of instruments which are out there on the end of the scan platform, the cameras, the two cameras, the infrared instrument, the ultraviolet instrument, and the full photorimeter. Uh, and that was the power. Also, we saved that power, uh, which could be then used to run the spacecraft uh, for, for well, until 2025, as we use up all the margin. So we had a nice big margin of power. But the main thing was we needed to release the room in the computers to better satisfy what could be done with the instruments that were the prime part of the mission. Right, and were we expecting to see anything out there in no, space? No, there's nothing to really image out there, because we've taken more pictures of blue dot, I guess, but... Uh, so space is really empty. If space is empty. <laughs> yes, yeah, space is empty. <laughs> okay, we'll take another question here. First of all, I want, want to thank you gentlemen, your associates, and everybody at the lab and elsewhere for everything that you've done over these decades, really, it's wonderful. Uh, has anybody thought? <laughs> has anybody thought of Voyager 3 and 4, one going due north, one going due south? <laughs> Do we live in a spherical uh, area, or is it uh, elliptical? What is it? Uh, that, I think the challenge we have is there are a lot of places to go. Uh, and uh, so all of these ideas, which are all wonderful ideas, get prioritized. And right now there's a lot of interest in going back to the planets, and when spacecraft do that now, uh, space, if they go to a planet we've been to before, they go into orbit. And then there is no further exploration. Uh, so Ulysses was an out-of-the-orbit polar orbiter, uh, so, uh, but it was relatively near uh, the Earth. It only went out as far as Jupiter's orbit, basically. Uh, these very long missions are challenging missions uh, to, uh, to start because in the case, we're very lucky with Voyager. Voyager, we did not reach the termination shock until 2004. Uh, what allowed us to have such a mission was the fact it went by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune along the way. Uh, so uh, that's the challenge, is finding something to do while we're waiting for the new regime, the new area to explore. And fortunately, Voyager had something to do on its way to interstellar space, and that was to sort of do the first major flybys with imaging and all that of the giant planets. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll take uh, the next gentleman's question. 
I work with the Deep Space Network, and I'd like to say we're very sorry about missing that observation <laughs> <laughs> on Voyager 1. Uh, there's something coming up with, with Voyager 2 and the southern station, um, the 70 meter, that is, it's getting rebuilt. It'll be out of service for about seven months to rebuild its big uh, bearing that, that, it, that it turns on. So uh, one of the things going on on the 14th of December uh, for Voyager 2, I mean, a Voyager 2 is going to be doing a magnetic roll, one of these important observations where, we, where you turn the spacecraft and we get a magnetic reading. The, the Venus Express uh, mission is also doing something interesting that day. They're, they're uh, doing a close flyby of Venus and dipping down in the atmosphere, and they think that's sort of important. <laughs> so I wonder, can you, re can you just give me some advice about which of these observations is more important <laughs> and uh, should actually get the, the time? Norm, you want to come? <laughs> oh, this just adds to the, he's just he's just asking the question. There's a, a mag roll scheduled on December 14th. Yes. But it's also the same time that there's a Venus flyby. Uh, what should they do? <laughs> well, <laughs> in view of the uh, exciting data that has recently been obtained by the energetic particle experiments and the possibilities that we are sampling uh, perhaps a connection to interplanetary uh, interstellar medium. I would uh, stick with that uh, mag roll to do the calibration. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, learned judge, for that wise advice. With no bias whatsoever. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll take uh, one last one of the Ustream questions, and then we'll uh, start wrapping it up. So uh, the question is, how did the Voyagers get a velocity advantage over the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft, which were launched before the Voyager spacecraft? It's, uh, but really, it turns out when Voyager was launched, if we had not flown by Jupiter, we would not have been able to get to Saturn. It was only by flying by Jupiter and getting Jupiter's slingshot that we managed to make it to Saturn. And Saturn gave us another slingshot. And the amount of energy you get from a slingshot has to do with how you fly by the planet and the closer you fly by. And basically, Voyager uh, was able to fly very close to these planets and get really big boosts along the, along the way. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you all for coming here and joining us to learn some more about the Voyager mission. So all I can say is stay tuned, because I think we're going to be seeing some very exciting science, hopefully soon. <laughs> hopefully not 177 AU. Thank you very much. And uh, they'll be around afterwards, so if you want to ask some questions individually. Thank you. Thank you.